Welcome to this COP COP meeting between the COP ontologies and the socioeconomic data COP. I'm Salina Bey and I will facilitate the session and present the, the speakers. So we have four speakers with us. They will give a presentation about their work. Sunho Kim, a senior data manager at IFPRI, will present uh, the progresses of Seance ontology. Xingzhi Song, research associate at the University of Sheffield, will tell us how he extracted concepts uh, for Seance using machine learning. Gideon Kruzman, Foresight and Exente Research Leader at CIMIT, would explain us what is OIMS. And Mark Van Fick, Senior Scientist at ILRI, will talk about TRAMAS. After their presentation, there will be a one-hour discussion facilitated by uh, Elizabeth Arno. I will now hand it over to Suno Kim, Senior Data Manager at IFPRI, to talk about SEANT. Thanks so much for the um, having this session together. So today I, I would like to introduce the progress of the social economy ontology. The SEONT is a joint effort from the two community of practice under uh, big data platform in agriculture. So ontology COP and social economic data COP. This uh, ontology, the uh, the first at the beginning, we tried to um, use some um, 100 question, which the social economic data COP um, working group, which is the minimum set of the agriculture household survey. And then the ontology is uh, trying to cover the, those 100 question. Uh, that on, our team does not create the ontology from scratch. We are trying to reuse existing ontologies. And then the purpose of this ontology is that whenever you have a survey, we're trying to use this ontology to annotating the survey. So let so that later we can use this ontology as a, a way to um, interoperability of the different uh, data set. What we have done so far is that we could initialize the ontology development, and then we have a 100 question workshop, which we will uh, mark or we present later. And then also we have a seven ontology workshop. We have some um, working group under ontology COP. We had a, a good uh, workshop together, especially for uh, COVID-19 is a virtual. And then we had some a good uh, output from there. And then also we released the first draft of seven and then we was another workshop with uh, ED people together to annotate the ED's uh, data set. And then uh, we also working on the building a tool to use uh, natural language processing to extract the concept from the questionnaires. So in terms of the number of ontologies, we have, as I mentioned before, we have a 13 ontology imported from existing one. So that's the list of the ontologies. And then let's talk about numbers. So we have 1,022 axiom, 280 classes, five, nine object properties and seven data properties and three individuals. Because the ontology itself is annotating the data set or questionnaire. So that's why we don't have uh, much individual right now because we're trying to add most of the concept as a, a classes. So I just go through some of uh, the model which we had exactly what uh, 100 question have. So the first one is that household composition and characteristics. We cover what is household, what is uh, age, sex and education level. The second module is the farm characteristics. So we provide the lender what kind, what uh, land is available there, how the farmers use it. And then we're talking about not only uh, crop site, but we're also talking about the livestock and fishes. And then we, the next module call, um, the cover the income and assets. So we're trying to put some uh, on-farm income and off-farm off income. So we have some uh, asset as well. Um, next module is a gender. So we are trying to add some gender um, the indicators and asset ownership, decision control, and the empowerment. So especially the we add some uh, gender indicator from the uh, um, existing the indicators. 
And then also we have a, a food security and dietary diversity. So we're using the food insecurity expense scale, minimum dietary diversity for women, and we added a more um, needed. And then we have a, another session called uh, other aspects. So we provide the extensive service and the innovations. So those are the uh, model which we have based on the 100 question. And then uh, in terms of the structure, how to build ontology, we are trying to follow the open biological biomedical ontology it's called OVO. So OVO has existing the practice in the biological domain and we adapt that uh, practice in the agricultural domain. Um, there are several tools that are existing, so we are trying to use the old tool, so then we don't have to worry about how to validate, how to uh, deploy ontology, how to make um, control the versioning. So we, uh, I think is we uh, adapt to very good uh, uh, existing practice into our site. In terms of a tool for development ontology, uh, we're using the Protege as a pro ontology editor. And then we're also using the ontology development kit, ODK. And then also we're using the regional, the palette and others. And then when you're talking about how to enter in extract the concept or information from the survey itself, we have a lot of different questions and then options, choices. So how, so first we review the existing extraction tools, uh, but we do not find what exactly we want to do. So that's why next uh, uh, presentation from the Zingni, uh, he explained what we have done, how to extract the concept from the questionnaire, Using the national language processing and different tech, uh, different uh, tech technology. So I also provide some idea how to we integrate the, this ontology to annotation work in terms of the survey. Um, as you know, we have a lot of capital in terms of the uh, survey um, the air, uh, survey domain. So for example, the ODK we using the, uh, survey CTO is another. Uh, very popular to using the survey um, development. So in that case, the uh, survey is still using the ODK and they also ODK provide XML based um, the tool, which is that you can provide the Excel and then you can type the question there. And then uh, what we can do is that we might use the COPO as auto automation tool. Also, we can use the um, um, to, uh, COPO to communicate with our extraction tool. So we using the either cloud or API if we have an internet connection or if it's offline, you can use the local container. We can put us a cloud endpoint. They ask, they send the question and the cloud endpoint to provide the uh, extract the concept from the questions. Um, I think that kind of work is need a lot of natural language processing. So I think the gate, which the Zingli use, I think there's a kind of good to um, um, leverage our uh, requirement. So that is all, um, how we can, how you can try, uh, find the ontology. So you can first go to GitHub and then get the ontology. So you can provide any uh, comment on ontology or if you say, oh, this is Tom is not in the ontology, then you can connect to us through the ontology community of practice or the social economic uh, data uh, community of practice. And then you can download from the ontology from that uh, link. So you can just uh, uh, scan the Q code, you can get downloaded. And then also you can send the feedback from, um, uh, from you to our team through the email. So that is uh, our presentation today. So Celine, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Ho, for this uh, presentation. So now, Singji Song, Research Associate in Natural Language Processing from the University of Sheffield, will, will tell us more how he extracted uh, terms for science using uh, machine learning technology. Over to you, Singji. Hello, uh, my name is Singji Song uh, from the University of Sheffield, uh, GATE team. So I'm going to talk about this uh, machine learning approach to extract the concepts from the questions. So uh, just to give you a general idea what our system do is um, our machine learning system going to find the most important words or you can treat this as a concept in a question. And this is a real world example. I think it's from the 100 question uh, Suho was mentioned previously. And this is the uh, real world output from the current 
a version of trained model. So these highlighted words are the uh, most important words that models think. So there are many ways to approach this. And uh, our model is a attention-based model. Just give you some idea what is this attention-based model is our model is actually trying to create a numeric representation. And this representation uh, represents the meaning of this question um, by looking at uh, the attention uh, weights for each of the words. This attention weights means how important this word should contribute uh, in the, this meaning building uh, process. But just like uh, many other supervised machine learning based approach, we need some kind of um, training instances to train our model um, to learn these kind of attention weights. But the problem is uh, we don't have any uh, training instances uh, when we begin of this project. So what we do is we use uh, the idea of transfer learning. So instead of training our model on the like social economic data, we are trying to train with some kind of other data, but to share some kind of similarity. Uh, for example, here we are using the data that's actually used in question answering system. Um, and uh, actually they are uh, aiming different tasks. They are trying to um, classify this sentence into different domain, like this talking about location or people, these kind of things. Um, the idea is we plug in our attention model there and get the meaning of this question. And we, we should get the uh, good representation that makes the um, next level classify, class, uh, correct, classify this sentence into correct domains. And then after we train our model with this out domain data, we can just directly take this attention model and apply to its this uh, social economic uh, related data. So basic idea is this data actually do share some kind of uh, common knowledge. Um, for example, they are all questions and question have some parts that are not important like every question have this question mark. So attention model gonna learn question mark is not important. This is also for I like the, uh, and these kind of things. Um, and of course, um, in the later, we have some kind of in-domain annotated data. And if you want to apply this to like your um, like domain to extract the some kind of important word, you have also like uh, annotate some kind of in-domain data and the fine tune the machine learning model. So to fine tune the machine learning model, um, one approach is like direct supervision. So basically, because we are trying to extract the, the most important word in a question. So if human can tell machine learning model, what is important, what is the important word, um, that's gonna be like perfect because model gonna learn directly from human. And this normally uh, works pretty well, but there is only one problem for this is it's quite expensive. You need to uh, go through every word in the question and annotate the important or not important, these kind of things. Um, so actually the process we are doing is kind of indirect supervision. Instead of annotating each word, we can annotate the, the question or entire sentence um, into kind of different annotations. In, in here, we are trying to map the question into the ontology class. And uh, we can, update our attention-based model um, using the same idea we are using the um, transfer learning. So we build the uh, meaning and uh, we have another classifier to do um, the classification and we can update our attention model um, using this kind of information. So this approach is normally cheaper because rather than uh, you annotate every word, it's, you only annotate on the question level or sentence level. And sometimes um, you end up with like two machine learning models. In our case, it's like one big model for two different tasks. Um, so you only need one set of uh, training instances. Um, you probably ask um, <clears throat> what is like more cheaper method? Um, sorry, before going that, I probably give you some, um, what is uh, looks like after fine tune and before fine tune. 
Um, so our, our data, our model was fine-tuned with the International Rice Research Institute annotated data. Um, and we fine-tune our model and apply back to the 100 questions. So you can see these are example uh, questions. And uh, the words at left-hand side are the most important words that's from the transfer learning. And the right-hand side are the words uh, from the fine-tuning. So you can see uh, before fine-tune, the words are like, uh, like OK. But after fine-tune, because uh, ERA data is more related to the agriculture, so the agriculture uh, concepts like land and the farm will be um, rated like more important in the fine-tuned uh, system. So as I just mentioned, there, there uh, is a method like um, we, have, we can doing like a more cheaper annotation. That is the reinforcement approach. That idea is borrowed from reinforcement learning. So rather than give like precise answer, uh, what is ontology is or what kind of task is, we can give some kind of reward. For example, uh, every time the um, system give you some, uh, some output, you can rate it this time is better or worse. So at this time, you don't need any um, fine tune data, but the model gonna do some kind of online updating. So it will learn update itself while you are using it. But uh, you need to be aware, give uh, a clear reward signal because when you train a student, uh, if student doing the same thing, uh, one time you, you say this is good and another time you say this is bad, that is gonna confuse the students. Um, right, this is my last slide. I think you're probably gonna ask this question. That's um, how much data is needed? Um, there's no easy answer. Normally more is better, but more not just mean like you have more instances. It also can mean you have like uh, more information related to the to the instances. Like you have um, many more label that's for different tasks, or you provide more background like context uh, related to the uh, to the instances. And um, that is kind of more more is better. Um, just to give you an insight what we do in in for this machine learning model is we apply around seven thousand out domain uh, training instances that is for the transfer learning. And we apply another 250, that is uh, the E-rate data for the fine tuning. And after this data, you will see uh, the result um, like we just, uh, we just saw in the previous slide. And um, if you ask like, uh, if I don't have 250 for fine tune, um, what can we do? I have to say like um, it, with the modern machine learning technology, even like uh, one shot learning is possible. But that is a trade off between um, number of data and algorithm design. Um, if you have like enough data, um, we can design an algorithm that's like directly address the problem and probably um, that's working well in the most of the case. But if you have less data, uh, machine learning engineer need go around of it and uh, do a lot of more complex uh, algorithm design over it. So that is kind of trade-off. Okay, that is the uh, end of my talk. Thank you. Get back to Thank you, Singji. Mm -hmm. So now Gideon Krusman, Foresight and Exente Research Leader I Simit, will talk about OIMS. Over to you, Gideon. Um, okay, I will talk about OIMS and uh, may wonder what OIMS, uh, OIMS means. I will get to that very, very shortly. Um, uh, for those who are not aware, uh, I coordinate the community of practice on socioeconomic data, uh, which is one of the two um, communities of practice within the platform uh, that is supporting the development of, uh, of Stay Out. So, um, what do we, what do we, what is a bit of the background uh, related to this? Um, the key to making data fair and fairer, uh, 
I'm sure that you know what FAIR means. That's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, uh, and FAIR yeah, is adding, uh, adding a little bit more to it. It's uh, making sure that the data is also ethical uh, and reproducible. Uh, the key to, to, to those two things um, is, good meta, is good metadata. Um, so, what we are dealing with is a situation where uh, data is in lots of different places. Um, uh, and um, it, if that data does not have good metadata, it, it's a data swamp. There's no way you can extract good data, for, uh, your information from, uh, from the data. Um, if you add metadata to it, good, uh, rich metadata, it becomes a, a, a data lake. Uh, from which you can uh, fish information from that lake uh, using uh, uh, ETL, uh, ETL procedures. Um, so this is all part of a data environment uh, where you have on the one hand uh, the, 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 your data sources, uh, and on the other hand, you have the places where your data is stored, the way that where it's analyzed, where it's deployed, where the data is being um, uh, is being used and and reported, and all of those issues um, hinge on uh, data control. And data control is just another word for metadata. So there are uh, a couple of different metadata types that are uh, that are of interest to us. Uh, one are the, is descriptive metadata, then there is a technical metadata, and then finally there is the structural metadata. Um, the descriptive metadata uh, is what you know. It's the the general description of the data. Um, this is what uh, what Guardian works on. This is the really the crucial part of making data findable. Uh, findable and that accessible uh, is that you know what data what uh, what the data is and uh, what it uh, what it is in in general um, and uh, in the case of the data at the, within the CGIAR um, uh, the use of sta a standard metadata schema such as the CG core metadata schema is uh, is essential for the for tagging descriptive uh, information to uh, to data sets. Um, your technical metadata is what makes the data uh, uh, acce uh, accessible. Uh, where where is it located? What for file format it, it, is it in? Uh, those kind of issues. Uh, the, the really the, the the technical part of being able to address the uh, 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 get to the data. And then finally, the structural metadata. This is what is really, uh, uh, really interesting. This is what, uh, what is what actually tells you what is inside the data. How uh, uh, that uh, all the little bits and bytes which are uh, are in there, the zeros and one in in binary, um, what it what it actually means. And um, there is a different ways of. Of, of capturing that one are data dictionaries, uh, which can be in uh, in uh, in a separate file, which basically describes what is inside that uh, that file. Uh, you sometimes have it as uh, as a tab of the data in uh, in an Excel sheet, yeah? where where, uh, where uh, all the different variables are uh, are described. These are all examples of structural metadata. Um, another example of structural metadata is the information which is inherent in some uh, some data uh, uh, data files linked to certain uh, pieces of software, uh, such as SPSS and Stata. Uh, the data files related to that contain metadata on that data. For instance, the the variable the variable labels. Um, the uh, the controlled vocabularies linked to certain variables. Those that information is in there. And finally, um, in terms of um, uh, other forms of software, you know, the the, the CAPI, uh, CAPI solutions, for instance, uh, the computer aided personal uh, uh, interview software um, will uh, will have uh, a lot of metadata 
linked to the questions which are in that sur uh, uh, that, that 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 solution for uh, for for doing surveys. Um, there is a lot of metadata in there. So these are all different forms of uh, of metadata and um, of structural metadata. So uh, when you're when you're talking about a metadata schema that can be used for making data interoperable, uh, you will need something that can deal with all these kinds of different uh, different approaches. So you need a kind of a design principle, uh, which is basically platform independent, which is a top ontology agnostic. It has to be machine readable, but at the same time, you have to be, uh, a human must be able to understand what is in, uh, inside. And it has to be flexible and extensible. Flexible because uh, it has to encompass so many different things. Extensible because um, if it's set in stone, then, um, then you know for certain that it's going to be obsolete before you even share it with somebody else. So what is the structure, uh, the structure of OIMS? Uh, so OIMS is the, an, um, ontology, uh, an ontology uh, independent, uh, flexible, extensible uh, metadata schema, which is machine readable and human intelligible. Um, uh, in order to, to, to ensure what, what, what I was describing earlier, that it, that, that it meets, that it can be used on many, many different uh, situations, um, it is designed to have a nested structure. Uh, so um, what you can probably relate to is that uh, in order to, to, uh, to, to, to understand a data file, you need a metadata file which describes the data file. Now, uh, OIMS takes this, uh, takes this further by saying, well, a metadata file itself also has a metadata file. So it's uh, the, the metadata file which describes uh, the, which describes the data. Um, it itself has metadata which describes what is actually in that metadata file. And um, you can then take that metadata file and, stru uh, and structure that uh, in a way that it it itself can be described as metadata. And so in the end, you get to, uh, after, uh, after uh, a few of these, uh, these steps, actually these four steps, you get to a situation that you have a metadata schema that basically describes itself. And therefore can also be uh, can describe the metadata schema describing the metadata schema that describes meta the metadata file structure, which means that you have now have something which uh, uh, you can use to describe anything. And that is the, the basic structure of what we do in, uh, in OIMS. And the basic uh, components uh, of OIMS, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the, diff, uh, all the, det uh, the details of this, um, um, is that there is only a number of diff uh, different aspects, components to it that really matter. Um, uh, one of them is, uh, 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 let, let's start with the, uh, we'll skip the first one. We'll go to the second one, which is the attribute name. And so an attribute name can be a, the, vari uh, the variable name, for, uh, for instance, uh, or the, the, uh, the metadata element name, or whatever it is, it, something has a name. It also has a, descri a description. That's a th uh, the, the uh, component number three. Um, uh, and it has a status, a status in the sense that um, uh, it's either required or optional or, or something of that, na uh, of that nature uh, so that you know whether uh, uh, you, you really need to expect to have that there or not. Um, and then you have a type uh, um, the uh, a type class, uh, which is basically that it is either um, um, uh, a, a a primitive uh, attribute, which means that uh, 
it has a, a, a value, it's a, 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 a certain value, um, or it is um, a, uh, a, a complex uh, type, which means that it's, it itself is made up of different, uh, different things. Uh, so for instance, in an example of type class, uh, so uh, um, it would be uh, if you have uh, a, per a, a person, um, then uh, that person uh, can be uh, can be uh, uh, the identification of a person uh, is um, uh, is complex because a person has a first name and a last name, and uh, so that is a way uh, uh, of uh, of doing that. Then the the next one is mul is multiple. Multiple is, is a yes, no thing where it basically tells you whether um, an attribute can have more than one, uh, more than one value. Um, so for instance, um, uh, the, um, uh, a, a, uh, uh, for instance, a, uh, an article, a journal article can have number, uh, a number of different uh, authors. And so a journal, uh, uh, the, uh, the authors of a, uh, of, a uh, of a journal article, that is something which is multiple. Uh, then within that, uh, the author itself, the different authors within the, uh, the uh, which, which can be in there are uh, of, uh, of type class um, uh, complex uh, in that they have different attributes uh, uh, attached to, to it, a different uh, a name, an, uh, an orchard number, etc. Um, the data type uh, that is uh, is, uh, is fairly straightforward. It's whether it's numeric or alphanumeric or um, a URL or something like that. Um, then um, the controlled vocabulary um, is uh, only um, relevant if the data type is. Um, an enumeration or a factor. Uh, so then uh, it basically says, okay, this, um, uh, this, uh, this attribute, um, uh, or variable or field name or whatever, um, can ha uh, has a controlled vocabulary. It can only take on certain types of, uh, certain types of uh, values. And these are those values. Um, and then, uh, uh, then finally, there is uh, the one which is uh, an ontology term. Uh, ontology terms are uh, uh, are uh, is the ontology term which is linked to the uh, to the uh, to the attributes. And then finally, you have also have that uh, within this, um, uh, you can have that certain types of. Uh, Elements which are under these concepts can be themselves linked to other uh, 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 other uh, uh, fields or components within uh, within the whole system, and that's by by you can link them through those attribute value uh, value uh, value elements. This in itself uh, is a self-contained system. Because we can describe these all these uh, these elements in their uh, with these uh, with these elements th uh, themselves. Uh, so an, attri uh, an attribute name uh, ha um, uh, has an attri uh, has uh, a, dis a description that an that an attri uh, so the uh, attribute name the name of an uh, attribute name is attribute name its attribute description of attribute name is what well, and that way that way through you can you can describe the whole the, the whole system so this is the underlying principle and building from that you can describe any type of meta, uh, from any type of metadata schema which will that which then allows you to link all the different uh, types. Now um, there is one little thing that I would like to um, uh, to also address, which was uh, mentioned already in uh, uh, in the presentations of Jin Yi and Sun Ho, is the issue of ontologies and classifications. Um, the ontologies, what we what we're talking about here, uh, the 
core part of an ontology are the concepts and the, these concepts and this is what uh, what uh, 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 Yi has been uh, has been doing is uh, uh, extracting the concepts from question uh, from quest, uh, from quest, uh, from questionnaires and uh, the question which is which is being asked uh, boiling it down into uh, into its the key concept that is captured there, and and then using that to identify what the ontology term is, which is in there. What I was talking about earlier, when we're talking about controlled vocabularies, very often this is about the content of those concepts. And uh, so, for instance, you can have the situation where you ask, um, "What crop is being grown?" And the choice can be in, in terms of a controlled vocabulary that it's wheat or maize or barley. But wheat or maize or barley in a, in a different um, uh, questionnaire, uh, in a different context, uh, will may be using completely different, na uh, different names. For instance, because it is in French or in Spanish, um, or they're using Lat uh, uh, Latin terms. Um, so this is where uh, these kind uh, uh, you have you can have a situation where you have uh, uh, a uh, um, a controlled vocabulary uh, in one place with uh, and a controlled vocabulary somewhere else that have terms which cover the same things but are uh, uh, but have uh, different uh, different words attached to it. And so these are the classifications, and by um, uh, these uh, these classifications that provide the content uh, of these on, of the ontology terms, and these multiple overlapping classifications can coexist. Then mapping these classifications uh, is the key to to interoperability uh, of data. Uh, even more so than uh, than having uh, than having uh, the ontology uh, the ontology the ontologies are let's say the framework uh, the classifications and the mapping of classifications is the uh, is what what makes uh, an ontology actually usable in practice. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Gideon. Um, so now Mark Van Fick, a senior scientist at ILRI, will talk about ROMES. So I'll give a short introduction around the Rural Household Multiple Indicator Survey, uh, ROMES in short, and I'll also try to make a link to the ontology work in the Big Data Platform. Um, that bit of the presentation won't be limited by too much knowledge, so I hope I don't make any mistakes there. Um, let me also mention Jim Hammond, my long-term collaborator, who was really at the, uh, the start of uh, Romans during his PhD work and later postdoc work and now scientist work at, uh, at Ilbury as well. Um, okay, so what is Romans? Um, and I guess I, we have given this presentation quite a number of times, so I hope for many of you it's not too uh, repetitive. So what is Romans? It's really a standardized framework for building farm household surveys, um, which is linked uh, to a standardized data processing infrastructure to rapidly calculate uh, a series of, uh, of standard indicators, uh, resulting uh, overall, in an overall database of harmonized farm household survey data. Um, sort of our niche. Um, so for topics commonly monitored in agricultural research for development projects, um, our approach tries to provide a user-friendly and efficient uh, survey approach yeah, for rapid, relatively rapid generation of uh, useful findings. Um, and by combining all of those findings, uh, we would we try to generate a large harmonized, uh, as much as possible, global database. Um, the way we went about this is uh, sort of to develop a semi-flexible approach, you could call it. So what the Roma survey normally consists of a core module a uh, core set of information that we try to collect in every application of the survey. And that core module is combined with a set of optional modules or extra questions that make the survey application fit for purpose for specific uh, projects or for researchers' interest, etc. 
So in the core modules, we always collect uh, metadata information about the household, gender related information, uh, farm production information in terms of land use, crop production and use, uh, agriculture inputs and livestock related uh, production. And that we combine with several welfare indicators focused around food, uh, wild food collection, food security, and hunger indicators, uh, dietary diversity indicators, uh, and indicators around poverty dynamics, you know, farm income, uh, access to credit, aid and debt, uh, and uh, property, uh, poverty assessment and income indicators. And like I said, we have now built up a whole library of optional modules around decision making on our more detailed information on all farm uh, land use, uh, crop allocation, etc. Uh, more detailed food uh, focused indicators, uh, poverty indicators, uh, environmental indicators, and much more focused uh, indicators around gender information. And like I said, we always combine the core set of information with these more uh, detailed optional modules to make sense that you said fit for purpose or the survey fit for purpose. I should say. What is what you could call unique slash specific uh, about Rome is um, the level we focus on is typically the household level. And the idea is, of course, if we collect an inf a lot of information about a lot of uh, households, then we can also say something more about uh, landscape level processes. Uh, time period, we typically cover the last 12 months, what has happened in the household or what has happened on the farm. And the focus is uh, that we try to get a holistic assessment of farm livelihood system components and interactions. Yeah, we don't focus on specific aspects of the, the farm livelihood, but we try to get a, a generic overall picture of what is going on, what are the most important activities on and off farm, and how does that translate into uh, different welfare levels. Uh, what you could call the, the, the philosophy, uh, sort of a Pareto principle, you could call it. So we don't aim for 100% of the information, so a full detailed uh, survey of all the activities, all the things that are going on farm. But you say, let's try to get at least 80% of the, of, the, of the information, thereby limiting the amount of time we have to spend with the, with the farmer. Yeah? Um, so we try to get as much as possible within a reasonable amount of time without trying to dive too deep, which can normally mean a lot more in depth in terms of time and in terms of information. Uh, very much uh, farmer needs uh, considered, yeah, from their perspective, uh, you knock on the door, uh, you, you want to spend an hour with them, what type of information can you collect if you do that in such a way? And of course, we try to be user friendly. Uh, open source is really a key, key aspect of our work. We make all the data, uh, survey instruments, uh, what's it, the analysis uh, code, etc. We make that uh, open source, we make it openly available, and we try to be both standardized and flexible to a certain extent. Uh, relevance, uh, I'm not sure I want to go too deep into this one, but we, we try to make operational efficiency gains uh, while uh, we have a setup for coherent monitoring across projects, um, and try to use that all of that to, uh, that information to build up a valuable data resource. So it's a product. Um, well, the survey has now been uh, used very widely, widely, I should not, not widely, widely. Um, more than 30, we have now a database of more than 32,000 interviews since uh, 2015. The use has been used in different CR CRPs. Uh, in different settings for a situation analysis, uh, sort of characterization of our populations, and also in project settings now, we have several uh, continuously expanding baseline end line assessments where we see changes over time by a wide range of uh, organizations we used. Continuously expanding. Yes, of course, because of COVID, uh, sort of everything came to a stop, but now it's, it's starting up uh, again. So all of that information uh, we uh, collated into a single database. Um, all database entries, the, the aim uh, and the goal, and basically a requirement is if people want to use our tool, that they are made uh, being made open access after an embargo period. Uh, we have earlier this year published the first bench of 13,000 households uh, online in the publication in Nature Scientific Data and uh, the database is online on Dataverse which has been downloaded quite a lot. 
Uh, and that uh, database contains 750 variables for each household. And we have already calculated 40 indicators. Uh, but we're realizing more and more that actually there's much more information we could uh, extract from those 750 variables to calculate many more indicators. For example, around crop production and uh, land use, we, we still don't know. We still don't uh, harvest everything that's in the database. So this type of data is, of course, operationally uh, useful for project design and, and for execu execution. And especially where our interest also in comes uh, is, of course, that, that large database is scientifically very interesting for process of, of uh, site analysis. You know, farm livelihood and uh, system interactions, focusing on drivers of food security. Uh, can we analyze general uh, gender patterns, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way we bring these data as well. Uh, we also try to publish data, of course, publish uh, scientific output from these data sets. Uh, where interesting is that in uh, this special issue, we are now setting up, we have been advised to do that, focusing around the Roma tool and the data, but also sort of what you could call the philosophy uh, behind uh, the approach. Results and reports uh, are being used in project cycles now. And especially interesting is the repeat surveys where we have uh, information on households over time to inform adaptive management and interventions. Uh, sort of the plans. Um, uh, really, the next and the next step, which we what we want to try to to uh, execute next year, so to speak, uh, is to package Rome as neatly and scale it out. And so basically, we build up that whole library of modules uh, around the Rome tool. And um, we're basically ready to to, uh, to wrap that up and develop a web-based uh, software package that people can uh, use, download independently of sort of what you could call the, the Romans team. Yeah, up to now we've sort of been, been micromanaging uh, applications of Romans, but we would like to take uh, sort of a, a more hands-off approach that people start using it uh, themselves, start using the indicator calculation scripts uh, themselves and thereby that the community of practice uh, grows further than, than just the small Romans team as it is now. Yeah, so that would allow use of Romans throughout the CG supported by uh, possibly trained individuals, uh, use of Romans by other researchers in the NGO sector without requiring our detailed uh, support. And hopefully that should lead to an establish, uh, establishment of an open source community of practice and a more rapidly growing database of uh, information on smallholder farming across, uh, across the world. Um, so here my, my last slide. Uh, like I said, not limited by too much knowledge, knowledge around the ontology we work. Um, I guess we, we, we see it as a fab opportunity to further systemize our, our data sets and our database, but also to, to make the link possible to other data sources um, and apply the FAIR principles. Uh, you could say Romus is FAIR, but it could be fairer, as, as, uh, as Gideon also mentioned before. Much more from a machine learning perspective, is still using the data of Romus and also other databases is still very much a hands-on uh, exercise by individual researchers. And like I said, this applies to the what we now call the Romus family, because we have the Romus survey, but we also develop any Romus, a shortened version of the of the survey, which takes about 15 to 20 minutes per, per household. Romus itself typically takes about 45 minutes. Um, and also Rome is COVID we, we developed this year, which has been applied already in six countries, which is taken up by several NGOs. But especially making that link to other databases, for example, the World Bank Alice and ISA data sets, uh, early analysis we did with in the Trillat paper, where we brought together other data, data bases from other projects uh, to try to do common analysis focusing on the drivers of food security. And of course, already mentioned before, is the 100Q exercise. As a one of you, um, I was involved in development of that one. It's of course very much linked to questions that are also in Rome. It's just a, you know, there is a, it's a strong link uh, possible and easily link possible. And of course, there suddenly, if that would happen, we could much easier link spatial data, farm household characteristics for different uh, from different sources, welfare indicators, and and do a cross site large scale analysis. Yeah, up to now we've done that sort of what you could call in, in a clunky in a clunky way, 
I have given here below two examples on the right paper focusing on food security and, and production diversity in global change biology. On the right, an analysis on, on uh, land sizes and, and farm production and welfare indicators as well across across African sites where we each time extracted from different data sources by hand the same type of indicators, now, which is of course a very uh, laborious uh, exercise. And each time you have to do it again and again and again to be able to do this uh, cross site and across data set uh, type of analysis, which is uh, not optimal. So that's that's where I see the, the big opportunity. And um, to do these these large type of analysis gives us enormous amount of information of the key drivers of, of uh, food security and for targeting and intervention type of approaches. Um, well, like I said, this was I think my last slide indeed. So thank you very much for your. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Oh yeah. Thank you all for uh, your presentation. So um, we are now at our discussion time. So we'll take the question from the audience and we'll also try to have a discussion among the speakers with the session topic in mind, how to connect RUMIS, ARMS and SEANS, the different tools that have been presented uh, today. So I will now let Elizabeth Arno lead the, the discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Celine. Um, thank you to all for your uh, presentation. First, I had a, a question to, uh, but Sonu replied to he, to to this question about the difference between uh, the ODK, which is an ontology development kit, and the open data kit, which is a, a kit for developing surveys. We have to be careful with in the use of those uh, terminology in our slides because it may confuse people who are using ODK to develop surveys and are not ontologists and ontologists who are using the open uh, on the ontology that uh, kit development kit so, so i think it's important and sonu said that she will be careful with that so i had a question to singji and after i will leave the floor to somebody else to to ask a question uh, singji you mentioned that um, uh, if you have uh, more data it doesn't mean you have more instances uh, probably because it, it means that more data are not bringing all the time new instances, but maybe very similar. But is the fact that you find the, the same instances uh, more times in a larger data set uh, provides a value or a weight to the result of your algorithm? Does it help? Um, if you have like a repeated instances in the in the data set, that, that's definitely uh, um, indicate this kind of instances is more important. Let's make the model mm -hmm. uh, more biased to this kind of instances. And if you think this instance is, is not actually um, like important, it's just uh, by accident, uh, it, we, we put more instances there, we, we could use some kind of other technology to like um, bias it back. But uh, the, the main thing is, um, just example, if we do some kind of sentence level um, uh, classification, let's say classification, if we can provide not just a sentence, but the context surrounding of the sentence, providing more information, that's also going to help uh, the machine learning model provide like more accurate result of it. So, yeah. Thank you. And the second part of my question was, if you if we were uh, to take the more than 3000 data set that Mark just mentioned that were collected with the Romis, mm -hmm. which encompass the 100 questions, would it bring would it have any interest for uh, um, your algorithm robustness to to process the, those data sets? Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned, if we provide more data, it's definitely going to help, especially this data is like uh, related to the 100Q and um, if, um, okay. yeah, this, this is my answer. Yeah, definitely help. Okay, and those data are on Dataverse, so they are open and downloadable. So we should make a plan probably with that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, Brian, you had a comment for Suno? Thanks a lot, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, my question to Suno was more around there's a slide on the integration of uh, 
or ideas on the integration of uh, the, the ontologies. Um, uh, I, uh, my, my comment was more on that it is it might be better to also include other platforms other than service CTO, such as owner, which are also ODK based, so that you don't exclude people that use only owner but not set, not necessarily service CTO. Although the platforms would, would use basically the same uh, ODK templates, so it maybe to be more inclusive, it might be better just to uh, to also include platforms like uh, like owner. Thank you. Yep. Oh, thanks so much for uh, indicating the owner system. Sure. So what we're trying to do is that maybe I need to work on Mark and then bring it together later, how to integrate to, uh, this whole thing uh, with the, uh, under the guide, guideline from the Gideon is that so the ODK, um, the service tier or the owner also using the same the platform ODK. So if we have a same platform and they we doing the XML based um, uh, Excel as a, uh, making the questionnaire in terms of user's perspective, I think we can apply the same technology to ONA as well as uh, Service CTO. So I will contact you whenever we have a concrete plan to implement, I will contact you get, and then we can work together to implement this kind of idea to ONA system. Is mm -hmm. okay with you? Yeah, thank, yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine. But maybe a follow-up question, Solo. Um, based on the, the 100Q, um, or 100 questions, I, I did not see anything on uh, adoption of agricultural technologies, particularly mm -hmm. in water conservation technologies. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering mm -hmm. whether, you know, uh, there was any consideration to, to include, you know, technologies because a lot of the CG centers are working on, you know, working with farmers, you know, coming up with uh, innovative solutions, technology. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, that was the missing link mm -hmm. from, from what you presented. Sure, yeah. Thanks so, thanks so much for your comments. I will uh, include the conservation and I also uh, uh, may working with or um, ask some uh, help from the mark, how we integrate together if the mark, the Ormis had the, a similar module there. Yeah. Maybe right, to, to chip in here, because that's, that's of course typically something that's very difficult to, to generalize. I could have got very specific projects focusing on say conservation agriculture or CSA or other other types of interventions. So it's it's difficult to to, to make that uh, generic like we we try to achieve in a uh, 100Q uh, setting. So 100Q basically the aim is to to give a generic overview of the key characteristics of a farm household, but that then should be combined with a specific module that focuses around the the interventions. Uh, are of interest for, to a specific project. Anyway, we didn't think it was, was uh, useful or even possible to do that such uh, in such a generic setting. And so within, for example, within Rome is of course, we have applied uh, the survey tool in different projects like CSA, uh, like conservation agriculture, etc. So there we have developed a little modules that ask uh, questions around specific technologies and the adoption of specific uh, technologies. Yeah, but in that 100Q settings, I thought it was, it was difficult to, uh, to include it as well. Thank you. So um, the next uh, question uh, was uh, to Mark by uh, Roberto Valdivia. I'm from Oregon State University. And yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, we, in several meetings, we discuss about the need about um, to have more detailed production cost data. Um, so my question to Mark was, if I saw this slide on new models, um, if this uh, feature of having more detailed production cost data was already included. So in, in several applications, indeed, we have. Uh, more detailed information around uh, production costs and around the use of, uh, of inputs. Uh, that's, that's typically um, sort of a difficult one to implement as a standalone module because it's so interwoven uh, with the information you ask around uh, livestock production and crop production. And so we have those, those questions, but whether you, you could call it a module uh, is, is a tricky one because it's, it's 
it's a set of questions that you have to ask throughout the uh, the survey. So just we have several applications, especially also in two recent ones in Cambodia and Vietnam, where we focused on commercial farms, where we asked those questions around production. Yeah, and I think Roberto's question is of interest, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for the agrofims tool, the agronomy field book, because there was the idea of having a, a costing module. So I think this is probably a discussion of interest to, to MEDA and agrofims team. So the next uh, question was from Matthew Lorenzon to everybody, in fact. <laughs> Matthew, <laughs> uh, sorry, the yeah, Matthew Lawrenson from Plant and Food Research in New Zealand, where it's uh, three o'clock in the morning. Um, it was really just coming to this field a bit from the outside, uh, uh, and I could see the value of Romus, but I guess we're also just looking within uh, New Zealand that we've just had a law change, or there's a, a refinement to our privacy laws. Um, and I was wondering if in the process of opening this data and I was seeing all the, the geo, geospatial points on the map, um, if, if, you're if you're geospatially referencing a household um, and you're talking about the income of the household and uh, quite, quite what would be here considered quite personal information, um, how do you protect the, um, the 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 personal information basically of of households? Thanks for the the question, Matthew. Yes, so that's of course a very important one, um, with which we are sort of continuously uh, struggling. So, um, we we sort of follow the the approach that the World Bank is doing and FAO is doing when they make those type of survey survey data available. Um, so we, we reduce the, the accuracy of the uh, GPS information so that, that you cannot locate individual uh, households anymore. And of course, we remove all personal personal data, uh, names, uh, telephone numbers, uh, all of that, that type of information is, is removed, cool. um, which, in, which in most cases means that you cannot uh, identify individual farmers anymore. Um, that that's, that type of system is of course not 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 perfect. Uh, you could have a, a very big a big farm uh, that's just a single giant commercial farm in a specific location. So you could you could always track it back to that individual uh, household. Um, so the system is not is not perfect, and it on the other hand also annoys any people working on say global crop maps who need a detailed specific field type of uh, GPS information where we say, yeah, we, we cannot make that, that information uh, publicly available. So that, there's sort of a, a struggle of, of different forces uh, going on there for what, what you can make available or not. And so we, we try to err on the, on the, on the safe side. Because like you say, we're also in, in specific countries that are, uh, say from a democratic perspective, not, not optimal. So we have to be very, very careful with the way we treat this type of sensitive uh, personal information. But that's, that's the approach we have taken up to now. So basically look at other big organizations. How do they do it? Are we satisfied with that? And then follow their, their approach. Thanks very much. Uh, can I chip in a, a second on, on this as well? Uh, so this is where, uh, where the metadata uh, part come, uh, comes in. Um, you, what you can uh, uh, what you can do is um, you can tag your uh, your data your data sets even uh, if you strip your uh, the data set that you make openly available of a lot of information you can provide the metadata on what was actually what has actually been uh, collected that might be of interest to for legitimate uh, for legitimate purposes. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, you can pro you can provide uh, in your metadata uh, the accuracy in terms of your geolock your geolocations, uh, saying, for instance, uh, well, we've uh, stripped it down to two decimal points because that uh, in this uh, in uh, in the in the context of. Um, uh, of this questionnaire, yeah, you're pointing to a sufficiently large number of farms. Uh, obviously, if you're doing an, uh, 
uh, a household survey in uh, in the uh, Midwest of the U uh, of the U.S., then definitely that would not be enough. Uh, you would have to strip it down to uh, to one decimal point or even uh, even less uh, 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 in order to reach that same uh, level of um, uh, of. Uh, of, anon uh, of anonymity. Uh, the same is the same holds true for um, uh, for something like uh, like household rosters in uh, in the Romus and the 100Q uh, approach. Um, the the information on household composition and personal information. Uh, Person, more personal information like uh, like education levels are already at a relatively high uh, high level of ag uh, aggregation. Uh, so it gives you the information on uh, the number of people within a household uh, and generally uh, uh, big. Uh, age brackets, but doesn't give um, uh, the details on on the information. Whereas there is a lot of a uh, lot of surveys, especially the LSMS ISA survey, where you have the detailed uh, detailed household ro uh, rosters. Um, detailed household rosters, uh, even in the absence of uh, of, uh, of accurate uh, geolocations, can be used to re-identify uh, re -identify households. Um, for certain types of research, there might be a legitimate reason to have that kind of information, uh, but then um, uh, you can provide the metadata that you actually have the underlying uh, household rosters from which you glean the aggregate information which you share publicly, uh, and then if someone has a legitimate purpose for accessing that kind of information, they can go through uh, an IRB or an ethics committee uh, in order to identify whether their uh, their purpose is uh, is legitimate and uh, whether they can have access to that uh, that level of uh, that that level of uh, of, da uh, of data. Yeah, that's, that's helpful, and, and and it's that kind of idea of uh, informed consent too of the the participants and and being happy for their data to be reused by uh, by others. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you. So this is also the the I would say the human process for um, accessing data that are uh, not available to anyone because of this ethical aspect. And I think Meda had a comment on the use of some R scripts, it's, it's, which mean, seems related because it's about that anonymization, isn't it, Meda? Would you like to make your point? Sure, thanks. Thanks to everybody. This is really interesting. Um, Mark, it was mostly to your point, uh, and perhaps uh, Gideon knows a little bit more about this as well. Um, the SDC guide seemed helpful to me. There's, there's a lot there. There's a lot... Um, of resources, helpful resources, including our scripts to help anonymize as well as guidance on different ways to anonymize different different approaches. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, I'm, I'm not a user of this. I'm just trying to understand from those who might have used the, the scripts, if you had used them, how helpful they are. Um, is this is that do you know of this resource and have you used it basically? Do you know if that? I can get beyond the, uh, the grass curtains here, uh, we've, we've just started. Um, no, we haven't used that uh, that resource, and we'll have a we have a look uh, look into that. And see if we, uh, the way they they use their R scripts, we can apply as well to our GPS coordinates. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for the information. Yeah, sure. They have they have they also provide quite quite exhaustive and good guidance on different methods. Um, and then I think for each method, they've got the you know the R scripts available, so you can actually let the user choose maybe, um, or you decide, I guess, um, in, in your case, uh, what method makes the most sense, what's most robust, and then you can, uh, I, I believe, just deploy the script quite easily. It's never as easy as it sounds, of course, but, but it's a start. Yeah. Oh, excellent, we'll, we'll have a look, thanks a lot. Meda, while you have your mic open, I see you had a comment to answer Brian's questions on the intervention. And would you like to make your point about Agrofims, please? Sure, just real quick. I, I think that was the the um, the question about uh, more agronomic uh, type of 
collection, I mean surveys, but but more tuned to, you know, how many times did you irrigate? Uh, how much water did you apply? How many times did you weed? Um, you know, all of those kinds of questions. Um, we are working with the CISA project and hopefully soon a couple of other projects to, to develop uh, we already have mock-ups and we already have sort of a, a, a way of proceeding on, on how people might be able to generate that kind of, you know, questionnaire uh, that's already based on uh, sort of ontological concepts. And, and um, very soon we hope to be able to, for the few questions that relate particularly to things like land ownership, um, there aren't, you know, it's not focused on those kinds of questions, but there are a couple of questions typically in the survey for that sort of, um, to address that sort of thing. Uh, we, we hope to dive into SEANT for that. So we'll be contacting the SEANT crew on that. So just a comment for Brian. Yeah, thank you, Meda. I think also that uh, SEANT is using some agro terms as well. So there is an obvious uh, connection to make between the, the two efforts. Uh, I think it's, a, it's a, an effort to be, to be discussed uh, after uh, continuing. Um, then uh, the next uh, point uh, we have here is, um, okay, so at the moment, um, so if you look at the chat, uh, Gideon has put some resources and uh, you, everyone can go and, and check those resources. I think it's linked to the, to the discussion we just had on the ethical uh, approach of the data. And uh, there was a comment by James, which, which I think also can be a, a good uh, introduction to the discussion on linking all those elements. James, would you like to, to make your comment? Hello, everybody. Yes, uh, thanks for the opportunity to ask the question. I was wondering about adoption of all these great uh, technologies and tools. So, it's, you know, I, I've, to introduce myself, I work with Mark Van Wyck. I've help, helped on the Romis tool. And with a tool like Romis or AgroFIMS, it's quite challenging to get uh, people to adopt it, to take it up and use it. But with uh, things like the ontologies or the best practice guidelines, I, I think it's even more challenging. So my question is about how, how uh, are the presenters thinking about uh, encouraging adoption? Who, who are the audiences who might use these methods? And yeah, do you want to go for the carrot or the stick? Uh, are we going to try, you know, maybe force people to use these or or encourage somehow? So yeah, that's that's my question, a discussion point, I suppose. Many thanks. Thank you, James. I think we have a very young attendees to this uh, webinar. Uh, so I think who would like to take that question? Let me let me give a give it a start. Um, it, it is a it's a really good point, James. Um, and it's definitely something which uh, which is uh, which is on our uh, on, on our minds, uh, and uh, it's one of the one of the aspects that we that we we, we considered when we were developing uh, developing OIMS is that uh, you need to have something which is not too tedious um, uh, to implement because if it's too tedious. It's you know it's really uh, uh, nobody's going to to do it. Um, um, uh, so uh, your you 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 started answering my question uh, uh, already in uh, when you were asking it uh, when you were say talking about carrots and sticks uh, because that's that's what I uh, the 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 what I always uh, when I'm uh, asked this question is what I what I say is you need both you need both carrots and sticks and so on the one hand you need to have uh, you need to have things in place uh, which uh, which will force uh, people to uh, to use um, use these kind of these kind of tools um, uh, where uh, where it uh, makes uh, where it makes sense um, and um, uh, in uh, increasingly 
uh, organizations uh, within the CGIAR um, are uh, are making more and more of an effort uh, towards making data uh, truly fair, which means uh, the interoperability comes uh, comes into play. Which means that if you want to have uh, 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 data sets that are interoperable, it has to be tagged with rich metadata. Um, and uh, uh, if uh, if organizations are really um, uh, serious about this, it will become part of the KPIs. Uh, uh, a data set is not a data set unless it has uh, unless it has rich metadata attached to it. And so that's one uh, that's one that's one part. Uh, so that's the 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 the, uh, the stick part uh, the stick part. Um, the um, the carrot part is in terms of um, uh, of making of making it as easy as possible for uh, for 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 people generating data um, uh, collecting data uh, to tag their uh, their data sets with rich with rich, with rich metadata and that's where uh, these kind of technologies can come in uh, com can come into play if um, it becomes relatively easy to do because it is linked to, for instance, the favorite CAPI software that uh, the re uh, researchers are uh, are using. Then yes, it become uh, um, um, it's not a huge uh, huge step. And especially if there is a stick somewhere behind, uh, uh, in the background that, uh, that's saying, oh, I need to do something. Oh, here is a way to do it really uh, relatively easy, uh, easily. Yeah, so I'll leave it to, to others to, to chip in. Yeah, Meda would like to have a point on this. And after, I would like really just we open the idea of connecting the elements. So Meda, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, thanks, Gideon. I completely agree with what you said. Uh, just to pick up where you left off, um, in terms of the keep it, make it easy for people to do it, I think that's absolutely key. Um, and, and I think, you know, Suno mentioned COPO in her, in her slides. And what we've done through Guardian is to build COPO into a, a few more sort of easy uh, work steps to um, to allow people, anybody from CGIR or outside CGIR to make their data fair. Um, so, so these workflows, um, and, and then sort of it, it, the, the, there is a, a checker, a PII checker that will, that, that starts the workflow or that could start the workflow. We haven't actually built it into the workflow yet, but it's part of, part, part of that. So the questions that were asked earlier about um, you know, GDPR and all of that. Uh, this is yet another tool that helps. So you bring in your data into, into the FAIR workflow um, after you check for PII, which is another Guardian tool that you can, you can use. Um, and there's a new interface now on Guardian, just hot off the presses. So all of this is visible. All of the tools are visible. So you can use the PII checker, you can use the FAIR workflow, makes it easy for you to do this. Um, in terms of the, the kind of stick, and you know, I just want to point out that a carrot does look like a stick. It depends on which end you're looking at. But, but um, the, 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 the idea here is that our funders and other you know, funding agencies in general are, are more and more um, wanting data to be fair. Uh, the, the, the BMGF, the Gates Foundation, now states fair principles on its open access policy that wasn't there two years ago or so. This is quite new and things are changing. Um, the, the EU's um, grant mechanisms for, for some time now um, have focused on FAIR and are getting more stringent with this. Um, our own policy in CGIAR, our open access and data management policy, is increasingly clarifying, uh, you know, putting more emphasis on FAIR as well, because we, we at CGIAR absolutely need to be at least in tune with our funders, if not one step ahead, you know. Um, so, so there is that policy and strategy environment as well that's that's going into trying to uh, provide the the incentives to, to and and the help a lot, you know. So not just saying okay, thou shalt do this, but but providing the tools um, through the big data platforms work to 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 enable that. Let me add one uh, one thing to to this. 
Um, peer reviewed journals uh, are increasingly requiring data to be open. Uh, so right now it's basically, you know, you have to provide access, uh, access to the data. So it has to be findable and accessible. Um, I'm pretty sure that the next step is going to be that it also has to have rich metadata because uh, just making the data uh, uh, findable and accessible uh, is completely useless unless the data, uh, the data, uh, the data is fair. And then that then becomes a really big um, uh, carrot for uh, for uh, for or stick for uh, for re uh, researchers. I mean, if you cannot uh, pub uh, publish unless you, the data that you uh, that you're using is truly fair, then uh, you better make sure that your data is fair. Thank you, thank you, Gideon and Meda, because I think it's an important point. Uh, it's kind of a stick and also a carrot to get your data fairer, that's for sure. And what I wanted to add is, for me also, um, apart from this uh, um, approach of uh, promoting the use of the tools to scientists, I think also something which is important to know is who are your users in this data flow? Uh, and how, and I think that's why we wanted to have the discussion on how to connect the elements of this data flow because uh, it will raise the interest of the users if the data are connected, coherent, and provide um, added value to the data sets. And um, so, from from the presentations, we can understand that you have the Romis toolkit. Let's call it like this. That enables anyone who wants to develop a survey to do it uh, digitally, if I'm not mistaken. And then this will help you collecting your data with already uh, uh, a formatted way, um, controlled questions and controlled vocabularies. So my suggestion, and it's open, is that uh, at the level of the Romis toolkit, there should be a way of checking uh, which ontology terms and variables are used for each which question, and this should be embedded into the field book. So the end user doesn't see anything of the ontology, but it's embedded into the, the tool. And then we have the, the use of COPO, as Sonu mentioned, and this should be done for adding metadata to those data sets, uh, or the fair workflow, as Meda mentioned. So once you have collected your data, and you want to push the data into an open repositories or a metadata platform like Guardian, you could use Copo just to add the metadata. And would it be possible to, to add the, the OMS metadata schema? Would it be possible to be granular enough to use your nested metadata schema, uh, Gideon, with such tools? And then once the metadata are added, upon the data files that are already annotated with good ontology concept and variables, this, this could be published online. And um, I think this would be a way of connecting the elements. Uh, do you agree with those steps? The speakers? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, in principle, yes. Um, uh, the way that OIMS has been designed is that it can work with uh, with uh, with almost anything, um, uh, as long as it has some uh, some structure to it. The, then uh, then it, then OIMS can uh, can work with it. So uh, uh, the COPO the COPO system and uh, and OIMS should be completely co compatible uh, compatible. Uh, I don't see any issue uh, issues there and. Um, uh, it's uh, OIMS is definitely something that um, a researcher uh, uh, would not uh, typically be using. This is something at uh, at let's say the um, uh, the data management uh, data management side, where uh, where you look at. Uh, 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 the kind of approaches that make most sense for uh, for the researchers, uh, and then ensure that uh, that though uh, uh, the approaches that makes uh, 
that makes sense for specific research groups um, are then uh, described uh, in an OIMS uh, uh, compatible uh, compatible way, so that it doesn't really matter how you uh, uh, how you collect your your metadata uh, or what kind of terms you want to use, um, what language it, it is it, it is in. Um, it will become uh, uh, inter uh, it will create the kind of interoperability with other with other data sets. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, what do you think, Mark, about having uh, your your web toolkit uh, for Romis able to to um, to extract or use Seant uh, and enable uh, your toolkit users to submit uh, new terms or variables if something was missing in the in the Romis, or perhaps the the module are. are are locked and you cannot create, but um, what, because uh, I see for Agrofims, for example, Agrofim is a platform that has embedded the concept of the agronomy ontology for creating the field books. So when data are collected, they are already uh, collected under the proper concept. So um, uh, what is your feeling about having something like this in the Romis uh, it, it, it sounds uh, super interesting. Um, just to clarify, that whole that whole web-based setup is is the plan for next year. So that doesn't exist yet. So so it's oh. all still on computer and uh, ODK driven, etc. But that's that's where we want to go uh, want to go next year. Um, because you now we have the, the the resources and the technical backup to to be able to do that. Um, so I guess the, the the steps you described just now are, are, are indeed very logical. Um, I, I guess my I would just say worry or it is the by just focusing on Romans you make it very Roman specific, uh, which can be can be dangerous as well. So I would I would say um, Roman should be one of say three to four different tools uh, where you try to apply this uh, this type of approach. And that we for sure make uh, or make sure make our sure that we include, say, a World Bank LSMS ISA type of uh, data, and that we uh, include uh, specific agronomic projects uh, type of household survey approach, a SimLessa or whatever. That that we cover those three or four. That we are sure that the methodology, the, the finally resulting methodology, covers those three, four, uh, what you could call different approaches. And I mean, one go make, make sure that those data are interoperable. And that would be, I think from, from our perspective and I think from many, many perspectives, a, a, a giant win uh, if we can do that. Yeah, yeah that we have yeah. those bigger uh, yeah. case like projects uh, like Enter Africa, so that they are on board as well. Right. And then one go, we would have a system that, that can have those multiple uh, interlinkages and, and make those data interoperable. Uh, rather than just taking one uh, one approach like Romus, which has its limitations, if you look at agronomic management and the details we cover there, but that we make that multi multi uh, multi purpose. So that would that would be my my first reaction. Okay. Okay. And um, um, so um, Seont is uh, including the one hundred questions into into the concept, and I think if we if we make uh, at least um, the link back from those Romis module and other projects like you mentioned that uh, at least uh, users can submit terms or provide feedback on the content of the ontology, then it will be, it will be uh, an added value also for Seont because uh, we see from the ontology we already managed that the feedback of uh, the tool users is always very useful because they are really um, doing practical exercise by creating their surveys and they all immediately spot when there is something which is not convenient uh, or wrongly defined. So it's also a way of um, increasing the quality of, of the ontology. So that would be a, a great step uh, to, to develop, I think. No, exactly. And then, and then 
you have a great starting point and that that can be uh, for them to give comments etc and then further to help it but again uh, coming back to the carrot and the stick uh, type of discussion if we have such a critical mass uh, of databases where such an approach applies to it becomes then also in more interesting for other people to start linking up to the to the approach because then in one go their data will be interoperable with the other databases and so that's that's suddenly where uh, quite a big carrot can, can come into place which has worked for us with the with the romus approach as well because in one go if people start using romus then the data are in one go uh, matchable to the other databases we have and, and, and linkable to 36,000 other observations. So that has worked for us uh, very well. So this, this, uh, this consideration is good for data that will be collected using Romis or at least have been collected since uh, um, 2015 with Romis, but you may have other socioeconomic data in the repositories that are, were not collected with those uh, this set of questions. So we also need to look at the legacy data that can be useful are already in the dataverse repositories, but are not really annotated using uh, the same semantic. So this is a, a work probably our data manager are, are thinking, I know that uh, Abhishek, I, th I don't know if he's on the call, I think he was, had a, had a, um, a question about how do we use uh, uh, the tools for uh, our um, surveys uh, we already have in the repositories and for the surveys that ICRISAT is, is collecting now. So I think what we need is also to have a way of, uh, for people to fi easily find those tools in an open access uh, and probably have a, um, uh, one stop shop to decide uh, and see what are the tools that goes together. So that would be a, a good resource, I think, for our data managers. I don't know if anybody wants to, to reply to that. I, I know Bosun was interested, Abby. Do you have any ideas or needs you would like to express in that discussion? Um, so I, I, we have some example how, how deep or how long it takes data manager to attack, uh, concept in the questionnaire because we had experience with the uh, eerie people and then we, uh, found that just two billion days they need require to uh, annotate the concept from the questionnaire to ontology. So that is kind of two days is two billion days is long. So even though it has like hundreds of questions, so two days, so one survey, uh, one questionnaire, two days. So it's a very long time. So if we uh, give us some more uh, freedom to data manager or data uh, the data people in the centers or CJIR, it would be good to have some, as the uh, as I just mentioned, we have a very dedicated, very good tool, useful tool for user to reuse it. Um, I totally agree with that, but I just add one more comment on that as well. Because when, when you do search survey in the uh, field, uh, maybe Gideon, Mark, uh, you are familiar with that. So on, uh, online, offline is very important. If you some need to change the question in the field without any internet connection, it, then we can do it later in the tagging part. But if we can like uh, um, package all thing together on the off offline field, I think we need to have uh, some technical support on that. So that is kind of one of the things we can think about. I'm not sure maybe Meda knows that uh, COPO can use it for offline or not, but those kind of offline uh, uh, capacity is important for this tool. And then the one other comment, I want to add the one more to, um, the promote our tool to uh, actual the scientists and on the researchers because the, when you we may have a set of the like uh, what I think is that we can give us the question and then we can automatically add on the uh, concept or ontology and then omit tech metadata together. So if one uh, users can click the one question and the other component ontology and then uh, omit is going to be getting together. So we just uh, Usual doesn't have to do, to do anything it, unless they want they don't want to change uh, they want change it. So uh, user can one click and then do e everything is a back end automatically. Um, but also we can provide a, a way to users to revise later. 
uh, or review later, but those kind of the automatic uh, way to, same automatic way to do this whole uh, tagging, annotating the process, really good uh, carrot for users because it, it takes like two days of the, two business days of the people's time. Yeah, it's manually done. And uh, I wanted just to say that uh, once Seant will be published uh, in the Obo Foundry um, uh, site, it will be made available through the ontology lookup service that is mostly used by annotation tools, the ABI ontology lookup service. So it means that when you, you could have a, a, an annotation tool using the API of this ontology lookup service and get all the ontology terms you need, and then people can just use a, um, a box to type their keywords and the system will propose the, the ontology terms that are matching those terms. So I think there are some um, perspective for making at least the ontology more uh, usable. And I think that your, your idea of the semi-automation of the, of the annotation and metadata addition is good as well. Yeah, and there also I would like to go back to the the question about the ONA because the uh, ONA and then the service service two is a more popular uh, ONA is more popular as well. So those kind of applic like uh, end user application connection also important for us. Uh, but for that you need to have some technical. I mean the not only the um the technical support but also the so ability to implement those the uh, technology on the or tool. Uh, through the, some uh, uh, finance support as well. Yeah, of course. Okay. So, any other comments, ideas, suggestions? From anybody? Okay. So, I think also one point uh, we can take out of this uh, discussion is that. Um, we have um, ideas to continue those uh, uh, well advanced uh, uh, development that goes all together in a way, um, but we are all looking for more resources indeed. So um, at least for the ontology part, we can continue uh, our effort um, next year and we will discuss that tomorrow in the COP internal uh, annual meeting. But I think there may be an interest of uh, working towards a, a concept note, at least first to describe what would be the, the work, what would be the needs, and uh, if the, how and uh, to connect those elements uh, when it is necessary, when it makes sense. Um, so thank you very much for your attendance to this session. We appreciate very much. Uh, and I must thank Matthew to be online at 3 a.m. So thank you all.